Hello, and thank you for joining us today. I'd like to welcome everyone, including members of the media, to today's webinar, the 2020 Supreme Court Update. This presentation will last 90 minutes. This webinar is available for CLE credit in California, Georgia, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Texas, and Washington, and it is pending approval in Illinois, Maine, and Ohio. For all other states, credit will be applied for as requested. Please be advised that there will be two points during the program where we will pause for CLE codes. During this time, a code will appear in the slide deck you see on your screen. Please make sure to write down this code if you are seeking CLE credit, as you will be asked for it at the conclusion of this presentation. A CLE program evaluation will be available immediately following the conclusion of the webinar at 1.30 p.m. Eastern, where we will ask for your bar number and the two CLE codes. If you have any questions, you can submit via the Q&A box on your screen. We will do our best to address them toward the end of the program. And now, I'd like to take a moment to introduce today's moderator. Carol Rendon is a partner in the Cleveland office of Baker Hostetler. In her more than 30 year career, she has been involved in nearly every type of criminal, civil, and regulatory investigation in many circumstances with experience serving as counsel on different sides. As the former United States Attorney for the Northern District of Ohio, Carol has significant experience managing crisis level internal investigations and commercial, regulatory, and criminal matters with a particular depth of knowledge regarding the False Claims Act, FCPA, the Racketeer Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act, and monitorships, as well as advising clients on structuring compliance programs. Prior to joining the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Northern District of Ohio, Carol served for a decade as a federal prosecutor in the Organized Crime Strike Force and as Chief of the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Boston, and for more than a decade as a litigator in private practice. Carol also clerked for the Honorable Joel M. Flom on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals immediately following law school. Carol, we'll turn it over to you. So thank you so much, Kristen, and thank you all for joining us today. I'd like to take a moment uh, to begin our presentation by introducing you to the other panel members who you will be hearing from today. So to start with Kyle Cutts, Kyle is based in the Cleveland office of Baker Hostetler. He focuses on appellate litigation, motions practice, and trial strategy in both federal and state court. His experience spans consumer class actions, commercial contract disputes, and antitrust matters. Kyle previously served as a law clerk for the Honorable J. S. Bybee on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Prior to attending law school, he worked in Silicon Valley and in Hyder Hyderabad, India, sorry for the mispronunciation, for Google. He also served as a Fulbright Scholar in Hamburg, Germany. Albert Lin. Albert Lin is a litigator and he's based in our Columbus office. His practice focuses on class actions and complex litigation with notable experience in financial services, securities litigation, government enforcement, white color defense, and appellate work. He works on large scale litigation matters, handling everything from pre complaint settlements to trial decisions and routinely interfaces with local, state, and federal enforcement authorities. Albert previously served as general counsel to the Ohio Attorney General, where he was the primary manager for securities litigation involving the state of Ohio. While with the AG's office, Albert negotiated the resolution of two of the largest securities class actions in US history. And last but certainly not least, Maureen Souls. Maureen is a commercial litigator based in our Orlando office, and she focuses on class action and appellate litigation. Before joining Baker Hostetler, Maureen served as a law clerk as well as a member of the staff to Justice Samuel A. Alito Jr. of the United States Supreme Court. And she clerked for Judge Anthony J. Sirica of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. She also previously served on the staff of the Honorable Sandra Day O'Connor of the U.S. Supreme Court and as a marshal's aide for the court. Drawing on those experiences, we're sure her insight will provide some color to today's discussion and analysis of both the previous 
and the upcoming Supreme Court terms. So it would be impossible to hold our annual Supreme Court review without spending at least the first few minutes talking about the most significant event of 2020 affecting the court. And that is the death and the life of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Like tens of thousands of women attorneys across America, I have been inspired by the torch Justice Ginsburg carried to light the way for all of us. From her example, I learned that it is possible to have both a successful and fulfilling career in the law while having an equally rich and fulfilling family life as both a spouse and a mother. Justice Ginsburg made all of us comfortable with the many firsts we would face as we blazed our own trails through the legal profession. Most importantly, Justice Ginsburg taught us by example that the fight for equality and justice is everyone's fight. For when we work for and make even the smallest strides in achieving a more fair and equitable society, every one of us benefits. As a Jew, the meaning of justice, the timing of Justice Ginsburg's death was particularly meaningful. The Talmudic rabbis taught that only the most righteous among us die on Arab Rosh Hashanah, the evening of the Jewish New Year, which is when Justice Ginsburg died. That timing they teach reflects the fact that even God couldn't bear to take the soul, person's soul back to heaven. And so she waited until the very last day of the year to call Justice Ginsburg's soul home. The poet Hannah Senesch aptly wrote, quote, there are stars whose light reaches the earth only after they themselves have disintegrated. And there are individuals whose memory lights the world after they have passed from it. These lights shine in the darkest night and illumine for us the path, close quote. I know that the light of Justice Ginsburg's life and her legacy will illumine the path for all of us for generations to come. And although I never had the good fortune of meeting Justice Ginsburg in person, my colleague and friend Maureen Souls did. And I would like her to share a story or two for all of us. Thanks, Carol. I think Carol has aptly captured what Justice Ginsburg's career and legacy represents for so many female lawyers, including myself. And to say that her career in life was inspirational is an understatement. But being a clerk at the court, it was evident not only how hard Justice Ginsburg worked, but how meticulous and precise she was. It seemed to be without fail that she would circulate a revised opinion, even making just a single sentence change within an hour of another justice's circulated opinion. And that change always clarified her opinion and made it stronger. But when I think back on Justice Ginsburg, I recall one afternoon, my co-clerks and I were fortunate enough to spend a brief period with her. There's a wonderful tradition where each group of clerks invites the other justices to lunch. And Justice Ginsburg was kind enough to host us in her chambers for tea and cupcakes. And as you can imagine, spending such an intimate time with Justice Ginsburg was more than a little intimidating. And we all knew that she was an opera aficionado. And so we did what I imagine anybody would do in that situation. We Googled topics regarding the opera so we wouldn't look foolish in front of her. But it wasn't necessary because Justice Ginsburg at her heart was a teacher. And she was so generous with her time, telling us who she was looking forward to performing, see, recommending certain performances we might want to um, catch, or explaining some other operatic topic. And although I can't honestly say it inspired an interest in the opera, it was an amazing experience. And the other thing that got Justice Ginsburg showed us was just how full her life was. She told us about her upcoming travels. She told us about her children and her grandchildren. And I recall a discussion about the movie 42, which candidly seemed off brand, but was delightful. She spent time showing us around her chambers, telling us stories about her various trips, about her family, including how proud she was of them, and the famous photo of her and Justice Scalia on the elephant. Justice Ginsburg was the epitome of life well lived. And what I can't forget is as she walked us out of her office, she stopped 
and she showed us a signed copy of the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. And she smiled at this group of Alito clerks and said something to the effect of, this was an opinion in which I disagreed with your boss about, but she was proud of that change in the law. And I think it's because she truly loved the law. It was truly a great honor to spend that time with her and learn from such a legal legend. Now I think that Kyle is going to transition into our discussion of the past term. Maureen, thank you so much for that. Um, I wanna welcome everybody today. It's great to be together with you. Uh, this is the fourth time we've done this presentation, although never quite under these circumstances. We've got a very exciting term in the past to talk about and an equally interesting one for the upcoming term. So let's get started. This is the court for the October 2019 term. The court decided just over 50 cases after full briefing and argument and signed opinions. That's a low for the court. Uh, that's the lowest it's been since the Civil War. Now, even though it was a low number um, of cases decided in this fashion, I think as you'll hear today, the cases are hugely consequential and have significant import going forward. The uh, thinking about this term got me thinking about a Time Magazine cover from a few years ago. This cover showed Justice Kennedy, who of course is retired from the court for a few years, and up close in a picture of him, it said from gay marriage to Obamacare, Justice Kennedy is the decider. And the point of this article and the point that it was trying to make was that Justice Kennedy sat at the ideological center of the court. From there, he could dictate how the court decided and did often dictate how the court decided significant cases. These cases ranged from Obamacare to health care, the death penalty, voting rights. He joined with his more liberal colleagues in issuing 5-4 decisions on these, on these types of cases. He also joined with his more conservative colleagues on issues spanning from campaign finance, the travel ban, and religious liberties. At the ideological center of the court, he was able to dictate not only what the court decided, but also how it approached it. And that got me thinking about this current term in Chief Justice Roberts. And I think for this term, Chief Justice Roberts occupied that unique role as the decider, although it remains to be seen whether that will continue for long term. He was in the majority for nearly every case decided this term. He dissented only twice, once in a case involving the state of Oklahoma and whether it could prosecute major crimes occurring on Native American reservations in eastern Oklahoma, and once in a case involving unanimous juries and whether or not, whether or not they were required when states were convicting uh, serious crimes. Of course, when the chief is in the majority, not only does he vote, but he also gets to decide who writes for the majority. And I think as you'll see here today, he was very deliberate in how he chose who would be voting. And of course, um, he also presided over impeachment proceedings this year. So it was a very busy year for, for the Chief Justice. But I will note that it's unclear whether the Chief will continue to occupy this role as the quote unquote decider moving forward. As I'm, you've almost certainly heard, the administration, the president has nominated Judge Amy Coney Barrett of the Seventh Circuit to fill the seat left vacant by Justice Ginsburg. It's widely expected by the president and others that this move will move the court in a rightward direction. And if that happens, the chief might, might find himself not at the ideological center at the court, but on, on, the, on, a, on a side where he's unable to exert influence in five, four decisions. He may find himself writing more concurrences, writing separately, or joining his more liberal colleagues in dissent. But of course, all that remains to be seen. Indeed, with every other facet of, of life, um, COVID disrupted the Supreme Court term. The court, um, in response to the coronavirus, uh, canceled oral arguments in March and April of this year. It then restarted oral arguments uh, in May. It heard 10 cases through live telephonic oral arguments, which was a first. And the court postponed hearing several cases until this coming term including the Ford Motor Company personal jurisdiction case, which I'll discuss later on. Now, this wasn't the first time that the court had postponed or canceled oral arguments. It did so back in October 1918 
in response to what's commonly known as the Spanish flu influenza. And it also canceled arguments back in the late 1700s in, in response to outbreaks of yellow fever. Now, eagle-eyed observers will note that the picture I've included with this slide is not the Supreme Court. That is a court out in San Francisco during the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic. Then, like now, it was encouraged for people to get outside as much as they could and conduct business outside. So this intrepid court took what I believe is a criminal proceeding and held it outside. Now, I don't anticipate that the Supreme Court will be doing that this term, but the, the weather is still nice. Um, instead, what the court did, at least in April, and will continue this October, is conduct live telephonic oral arguments. And this is a first, the first telephonic oral arguments and the first time it's made it available live to the public. And so what the Supreme Court did is it gave its live audio feed to news outlets, and then you could sign into your favorite news outlet and hear the arguments live. It was a great experience. And in, in my view, I think it was a huge success, all things considered. Sure, there were a few hiccups. The, the mute button stymied the justices occasionally. I know I've been guilty of that too. There was a mysterious flushing toilet during one of the arguments. Um, but, but other than these minor hiccups, I think it worked really well. And I think the Supreme Court was smart about the way it made small adjustments to how cases were argued. Um, being on the telephone, what the court did is it allowed the attorney a few minutes of uninterrupted time to make his or her case, at which point the questioning began beginning with Chief Justice Roberts and then going down the line in order of seniority. One of the, one of the unique features of this oral argument that was that Justice Thomas was an active participant. Oftentimes, as you may know, he uh, doesn't ask many questions on the bench. He prefers to let the attorneys argue the case. He views it as their time. But he came prepared with many, uh, I think, very incisive, very effective questions that often set the tone for the oral arguments. And so I think the format worked really well. And this is the format the court will be using again in October. They'll, they'll again be making uh, oral arguments live. You can start listening in on October 5th when the first cases in this term would be argued. I'd encourage you to do so. And one more comment before we, we move on. I would, uh, it's a small critique, but I think I share it with Chief Justice, or excuse me, with Justice Breyer, who said that although telephonic argument works very well, it's a little less fun. And I think that I think that's right. You miss the live in-person argument when you've got the justices interrupting one another or piggybacking off of questions or pulling the attorney back to another justice's questioning. It's a lot of fun. You get to hear a little bit of the justices' personalities and also get a sense of how they're thinking about the case and maybe even a little bit of, of how they're leaning in the case. But overall, that's a small critique, all things considered. Now, of course, the Supreme Court did not go full Zoom. Uh, as many state Supreme Courts did and other lower federal and state appellate courts did. Um, I think this was a very effective way to hear oral argument. Um, I, will say, I will say this, um, the trend of live telephonic oral arguments, if and when things return back to normal, I hope the court continues to make oral arguments live so that the public can listen in in real time. Usually the court waits until Friday of the week at, after arguments in order to release audio. But I think the live arguments is a nice way for the public to engage with the court. It's not as extreme as something like allowing cameras into the courtroom, but to me it provides a nice middle ground there that would encourage public engagement. And in fact, there's been senators on both sides of the aisle that have spoken out to encourage the court to continue to make audio live. And I certainly hope they do so. So there's a lot of cases to discuss this term. And before I turn it over to my colleagues, I wanted to highlight a few that, um, that I didn't want to let, let slip through the cracks. If this presentation were twice as long, I don't think we could still address all the important and interesting cases from these terms, but I wanted to highlight a few here. There was what was thought to be an important Second Amendment case that turned out to be an interesting case on mootness. There was a challenge to reproductive rights where the Chief Justice uh, added the fifth vote to his four liberal colleagues' votes in striking down a Louisiana law. There was the aforementioned Oklahoma case, a hugely important case for the state of Oklahoma, a dispute over appointments in Puerto Rico, an incredibly interesting uh, Clean Water Act case out of Hawaii. And I'd like to close a little bit by talking about the court's specialized docket or its shadow docket. And the shadow docket is a term coined by a University of Chicago law professor that 
that discusses those cases that reach the Supreme Court through expedited or emergency basis. Um, this, these are cases that are reaching the court very quickly. They rarely, if ever, involve oral argument. They don't usually produce long written opinions, but they're nonetheless very important. And you've probably heard of some of all of the ones that I'm going to discuss. There were two cases challenging restrictions placed by state governors on religious assembly. Um, there's one out of California and one out of Nevada. The court upheld both of those restrictions in light of COVID that limited the number of people that it could, could attend religious services. The one in Nevada um, produced a single line order from the court and then 21 pages of dissents from Justices Alito, Kavanaugh, and Gorsuch. There was an important uh, case involving Wisconsin, the Supreme Court, which re rejected Wisconsin's attempt to expand the voting period in light of COVID. The Supreme Court voted to allow federal executions to go forward the first time in years. So, so there was a lot of important cases that, uh, that appeared on the shadow docket. And seeing how challenges to administration activity continue and seeing that the pandemic is ongoing and litigation continues over those cases, I would expect to see this emergency or shadow docket continue to be busy, busy going forward. And with that, I'll turn it over to Maureen. Thanks, Kyle. Um, I thought we would start first with two related cases that involve whether the Constitution prohibits subpoenas issued to financial institution seeking the president's non-privileged personal financial records. And these two cases, I think, epitomize interesting legal questions that have a limited impact. And so while as lawyers, we're all very excited for these cases, to say that you're going to be able to go back to your clients and say, here's a way we can uh, avoid these subpoenas, Unfortunately, these cases aren't going to provide it, but nonetheless, they're incredibly interesting. So first, Trump v. Mazars. This dispute started in April 2019 when three uh, House committees issued subpoenas seeking the president's financial records. And each of these subpoenas were directed to institutions that held the president's personal uh, records. And so the records were sought for investigations that the House committees were conducting. In one case, an investigation into possible foreign influence in US elections. In another, uh, foreign efforts to undermine the US political process. And finally, uh, an investigation into the adequacy of current government ethics laws. And President Trump challenged each of these subpoenas claiming that the uh, committees lacked a legitimate legislative purpose and that the subpoenas violated the separation of powers. Now, First, the Mazars case, that was proceeding in the DC District Court. And ultimately, the DC Circuit upheld the issuance of the subpoena because it was served for a valid legislative purpose. And then the subpoenas issued to the financial institutions, um, uh, Dutch Bank and Capital One, the Second Circuit ultimately upheld the denial of a preliminary injunction because the subpoenas were issued as part of a valid investigation into alleged foreign influence over President Trump. Ultimately, the court upheld both. The Chief Justice wrote for the majority opinion, and it was a seven-member court, which I think is important because it shows that there's consensus on this issue. The court held that Congress has the power to obtain information so that it can craft legislation effectively. But the court recognized that the power is limited and congressional subpoenas are valid only if they serve a valid legislative purpose. These subpoenas are not permitted for law enforcement efforts. The court rejected President Trump's argument that Congress must meet a higher standard and that Congress must show that the, that the information is demonstrably critical to its purpose when it seeks the president's records. And they did so because they didn't want to impede the valid legislative investigation. Ultimately, the court did reject the House's argument that the subpoena should be upheld as long as the committees had a valid legislative purpose because the court found that approach fails to take adequate account of the significant separation of powers issues raised by congressional subpoenas for the president's information. So what the court did was craft a, almost a middle ground and said that the fact that the subpoenas request that the personal papers rather than the official records makes the problem worse and why it had to reject the House's argument for a, just a valid legislative purpose to support the subpoenas. 
the court sent it back to the lower courts to perform a careful analysis that takes adequate account of the separation of powers principles at stake, including the significant legislative interest of Congress and the unique position of the president. And because the lower court did not adequately consider these special concerns in the separation of powers, the cases returned to the lower courts for additional proceedings. Justice Thomas ultimately dissented because he would hold that Congress can never issue a legislative subpoena for, for private unofficial documents, no matter whom they belong to, because Congress may be able to obtain these documents as part of an investigation of the president, but it must use its impeachment power to do so. Justice Alito also dissented. He agreed with his colleagues in the majority that the lower courts erred um, and that these cases must be sent back for another look, but he would outline a new test that says that unless the house, that the house is required to show more than it has put forward to date. And because the uh, confines of the remand were inadequate, he dissented. In the, in the related case of Trump v. Vance, the Manhattan district attorney, um, Mr. Vance issued a subpoena to President Trump's uh, accounting firm as part of a state grand jury investigation into criminal violations of New York law. President Trump asked a federal court in New York to block the subpoena, arguing that under Article II and the Supremacy Clause, a sitting president enjoys absolute immunity from state criminal process, and thus the subpoena could not be enforced while he was in office. Both the a lower court, the district court, and the federal court of appeals rejected the president's request and agreed with the state that the subpoena could be enforced. Chief Justice Roberts again wrote for the five court majority, and he pushed back against the president's contention that having to comply with a state criminal subpoena would distract him from his job as president. He's, the court wrote that two centuries of experience show that a tailored criminal subpoena will not normally hamper the performance of the president's constitutional duties. The court was similarly dismissive of the president's claim that the stigma of being subpoenaed will undermine his leadership at home and abroad. And finally, addressing the last argument in favor of absolute immunity, the court rejected the idea that the president could face harassment from thousands of local district attorneys who might be trying to score political points by investigating the president was uh, not based in any evidence. The court said there are protections within the legal system to protect against these kinds of abuses. For example, grand juries can engage in fishing expeditions and uh, the constitution prohibits state judges and prosecutors from interfering with the president's official duties. Ultimately, the court declined to adopt a bright line rule that would require state grand jury subpoenas for the president's private papers to meet a higher standard. He, the court explained that adopting such a rule would create a double standard because federal subpoenas to the president, unlike state subpoenas, would be allowed wherever the evidence was material. And so the court said, unless there's a need to protect the president, the public interest in fair and effective law enforcement cuts in favor of a comprehensive access to evidence. If state grand juries had to meet a higher standard, it would be harder for them to do their work and could even prejudice the incident by depriving the grand jury of evidence that might show they were not guilty. This case too was sent back to the lower courts to allow President Trump to raise additional arguments challenging the subpoena. Justice Kavanaugh uh, concurred in the judgment, but he did not agree with the court's reasoning. He agreed that the president is not absolutely immune from state criminal subpoenas and that the case should go back to the district court. But he would require state grand jury subpoenas to meet a higher standard that would require a showing of demonstrated specific need for the information. Justice Thomas again dissented and while he agreed that the president is not entitled to immunity from the issuance of the subpoena, he argued the president may be entitled to release from the enforcement of the subpoena. Justice Alito also again dissented, and he described the event that precipitated this case as unprecedented, and he would impose a higher standard for state grand jury subpoenas like this one and require courts to take into account the need to prevent interference with the president's discharge of the responsibilities of the office. 
Justice Alito said that the, that the court's majority opinion treats the subpoena at issue like any ordinary grand, jurors, grand jury subpoena, which it's not, because the presidency deserves greater protection. So then the question is, what happens next? This case is already progressing in the lower courts. Last Friday, the Second Circuit heard arguments in Trump v. Vance and candidly seemed a little skeptical about President Trump's arguments regarding the scope of these subpoenas. And later in the, um, October, the DC Circuit will hear arguments regarding the challenges to the House uh, subpoenas. Now, what happens after this? An election. So whether the House committee will reissue these subpoenas, we don't know. But these, this battle will continue on as President Trump is uh, permitted to continue on his challenge to the scope of the subpoenas issued. And so from there, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Albert. Hi, everybody. Uh, the next case we're discussing uh, today is Department of Homeland Security uh, versus Regents. And this case, is a challenge by third parties uh, like the University of California and affected individuals um, to Homeland Security's termination of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, or DACA. As you may recall, uh, the DACA program uh, was implemented in the Obama administration in 2012 and granted, uh, granted so-called DREAMers a uh, two-year forbearance uh, from removal from the country. And DREAMers are individuals uh, who were brought uh, to the United States uh, illegally uh, when they were children uh, and uh, satisfied a series of qualifications such as never having uh, been committed a crime. Uh, after the election, um, well, during the election cycle, President Trump indicated that he would repeal uh, DACA, which was uh, an executive order. And uh, uh, after uh, he took office, uh, his department uh, followed through on that promise. In 2017, Homeland Security indicated that uh, DACA would start to wind down. Uh, and those dreamers, uh, certain dreamers with six months left on their two-year forbearance could apply for renewal, uh, but no new applications would be permitted and people outside that window uh, could not apply uh, for renewal. Uh, many plaintiffs sued, um, claiming that Homeland Security's order violated uh, the Administrative Protection Act, and the University of California in particular argued uh, that the order uh, violated equal protection. Three district courts held that uh, the administration's uh, order uh, and action um, uh, violated the APA. Uh, in the Regents case, the Northern District of California held um, that uh, the rescission violated or plausibly alleged a violation of the Equal Protection Clause, and cert was granted. Um, in a five to four holding, uh, the Supreme Court held um, that the administration's um, rescission of DACA did in fact uh, violate the administration, Administrative Procedure Act. Um, it first held that um, the rescission was something appropriate for judicial review. Unlike a removal proceeding, which is not reviewable, this was a policy consideration, a policy decision by the agency, which was a proper focus for the judiciary. Um, the majority then walked through the various reasons why Homeland Security's rescission uh, violated the uh, Administrative Procedure Act, a standard which is very difficult uh, to show, that the agency's decision was arbitrary and capricious. Crucial to the decision, was that Homeland Security's decision was, uh, rescission rather, was a post hoc rationalization. That much of the justification for the rescission occurred after court opinions had been issued, noting that procedural niceties had not been complied with in rolling back uh, DACA. Um, in addition, uh, the court noted that Homeland Security had accepted other agency determinations that DACA was illegal without scrutiny. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, the court uh, took uh, notice of the fact that Homeland Security simply accepted the Attorney General's determination that DACA was illegal and did not perform a separate nuanced um, interpretation. The third major uh, reason why uh, APA was violated 
the court noted was that the DHS Homeland Security should have addressed the reliance interests of individuals affected uh, by DACA. Uh, the Supreme Court noted that while accommodations for affected DREAMers was not required, the mere failure to consider those substantial reliance interests were arbitrary and capricious. Next slide, Christy. Uh, and so uh, in, a, in, a, in a secondary holding, uh, the court then noted that uh, there was not a plausible allegation that the administration uh, had violated equal protection in rolling back uh, DACA. It analyzed certain of the president's uh, unfortunate comments uh, during the campaign cycle and noted that those comments were remote in time and unrelated to uh, the specific uh, rollback of DACA. Uh, two notable dissents here uh, in this case. The first is uh, Justice Sotomayor. Uh, and in this dissent, uh, uh, Sotomayor uh, took issue with the majority's view um, that statements in the administration uh, did not raise a plausible inference of racial animus. The, uh, Justice noted that given uh, the number of comments the President had made uh, relating to immigration and Latinos were sufficient to establish uh, animus and sufficient to create the inference that perhaps Homeland Security was merely trying to execute on these campaign promises. Um, the second um, notable dissent uh, was uh, of Justice Thomas, noting that DACA was implemented without any statutory authority and therefore the APA could not apply at all, uh, that the uh, order was uh, void ab initio, in effect. Um, the impact of this decision um, is very uh, uh, widespread and uh, you know, deeply felt throughout uh, the community of immigrants in this country. Um, there are over 700,000 uh, participants uh, in the DACA program because the administration's rollback of the DACA program um, uh, it, it has been uh, overturned, the administration has to start the process of rolling back DACA again from the beginning. And this provides um, uh, some practical additional forbearance for those seeking uh, uh, to avail themselves of the benefits uh, of DACA. From, uh, and given the fact that we're in an election cycle, it's unclear um, if DACA, if there will be a second attempt to roll back DACA. Um, uh, on a going forward basis from an administrative law standpoint, um, where agency orders are sought to be rolled back, um, uh, one ruling and learning from this opinion will that be that reliance interests should be taken into account uh, in order to uh, 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 hurdle the arbitrary and capricious standard. And now I think Kristen is gonna provide us some very critical information. Thank you, Albert. Please record the code SUPREME1 for the post-program evaluation. Please make sure to write down this code if you are requesting CLE credit, as you will be asked for it at the conclusion of this program. SUPREME, the number one. Please record this code. We'll turn it back to you, Kyle. Thanks, Kristen. So this is, a, this is a pretty interesting case. It may be first remembered as the first case ever to be or, uh, argued by live telephonic argument, but it's a really interesting case in its own right. Deserves a few words here. I'm guessing that more than three quarters of you understand that Booking.com is a brand name and not just a generic name for a travel website. How do I know that? Because that's what the survey evidence that Booking.com submitted to the district court in this case showed. Booking.com had applied to the US and Patent and Trademark Office to trademark its name, Booking.com. The Patent and Trademark Office had denied the registration, citing the generic nature of the term. Now, all parties generally agreed that the word booking by itself was generic and the USPTO has a long-standing policy of not issuing trademarks for generic words. The dispute was whether over adding the .com to booking made the generic term more descriptive and therefore capable of trademark registration. In front of the district court, booking.com submitted survey evidence showing that about three quarters of participants understood or identified booking.com as a brand name. They also surveyed washingmachine.com 
which was a made up name, not a brand name. And far fewer people identified that as a brand name. The district court found this persuasive and held that the trademark, should, trademark protection should have issued. The appellate court agreed and the Supreme Court agreed. Writing for an 8-1 majority, Justice Ginsburg succinctly wrote, because booking.com is not a generic name to consumers, it is not generic. In other words, because trademark law is largely interested in protecting consumers and making sure that consumers know with whom they're dealing, and consumers understood that booking.com was its own thing, not merely a generic for a travel reservation website, it was appropriate to give it trademark protection. Now, Justice Breyer was the lone dissenter. He's questioned the, the, the court's reliance on survey evidence. He noted that when you took out the participants that identified both booking.com and washingmachine.com as brand names, the number that were able to correctly identify booking.com as a brand name was quite lower. And so there he, therefore he questioned the validity. He also said this case was a lot like the Goodyear case decided many years before by the Supreme Court. There you had the situation of adding a, the word company to a generic name. So wine company, wine, a generic term, adding the word company to the end of it would not make it more descriptive or susceptible to trademark protection. He goes, this is the same situation. You have .com that you're appending on a generic word. That doesn't change the generic nature of it. And he worried about abuses going forward um, by companies wishing to compete on generic names, adding .com. The majority for its part responded to this argument going, no, there can only be one booking.com. That's how URLs work. You can have 50 billion wine companies, but because you can only have one booking.com on the internet, it's appropriate to get a trademark protection here. Um, I think this is an important case going forward. I think it may make the registration of generic words with dot-coms easier and may actually chill overall denials of patents and trademarks on the generic basis. It certainly puts a lot of emphasis on survey evidence to show what consumers do and do not understand about a specific brand. And with that, I'll turn it over to Maureen. Thanks. Uh, I'm next going to talk about Chifalo versus Washington. And this has been known as the faithless elector case. And here there were three electors that um, in Washington that violated the Washington Pledge that stated that you have to vote for the candidate that wins statewide in your office. And so what these three electors did is that they said, although Hillary Clinton won the statewide office in Washington, we're going to write in Colin Powell um, in a hopes that they could throw the election to the House of uh, Representatives um, and deprive Donald Trump of a victory in the Electoral College. Unfortunately for them, uh, Washington uh, has this pledge that's backed by a sanctions. So they were each fined $1,000 for their um, efforts to deprive Donald Trump of the majority. Um, and so what they did is in state court, they argued that this fine by on, was improper under the constitution because electors are supposed to vote for whom they think is proper. That's the structure. There was also a companion case that arose out of Colorado. Um, similar structure there, there was a late recusal. It was uh, a little interesting um, shortly after, I believe it was the argument uh, where Justice Sotomayor uh, learned that she was personal friends with one of the electors. So she recused and it was just an eight member court. And so that uh, case, although raising similar issues, was just decided as a per curiam. Justice Kagan wrote the uh, majority opinion and she wrote for an eight court um, majority. And candidly, just this is a typical Justice Kagan uh, well-written opinion and she provides us with a brief civics lesson with also some pop culture references. And so she um, makes such references as to the show Veep and Hamilton um, in her efforts to uh, bring back the uh, Burr song uh, and the, uh, the, the election with uh, Jefferson. And so what she focuses on here is that the constitution does not speak to how the electors are supposed to vote. That the, in fact, the constitution um, has very little to say about elect electors and it just says that um, it doesn't say anything about how they are supposed to be faithful to a party or popular preferences in the election. And nothing in the constitution prohibits states from taking away presidential electors 
voting discretion. And so then she turned to historical practice. And she said that electors have only rarely exercised discretion in casting their ballots for president. Um, states did not intend to choose electors who would be free agents and make their own decisions about the best candidate. Rather, states wanted the electors to cast ballots for their party's candidate, reflecting the will of the people. And so for that reason, there was nothing improper about the sanctions backed pledge here, and th those can go forward. Justice Thomas concurred in the judgment and wrote separately. And he wrote because he said that the faithless elector laws are constitutional, agreeing with the end result. But he did not agree that the Constitution, um, with the reasoning, Justice Thomas believes the Constitution does not say anything about whether the states have the power to require electors to vote for the candidates they pledge to support. And so he would uphold the ground, uphold the law on the ground that any powers that the Constitution does not specifically give to the federal government either give to the federal government or take away from the states belongs to the states. And for that reason, this law was proper. So what does that mean going forward? That these types of pledge laws are permissible. Now, since the, the imposition of the fine, Washington has walked back the fine. So there's no longer a thousand dollar fine, but instead they just remove you as an elector going forward. I would imagine that in the future, states will start to enforce these laws to avoid what was one of the main arguments and a thrust of this um, oral argument. What would happen if electors did this, use their discretion in this way? Everybody's afraid of chaos. We all know we don't need a chaos in the elections. And so I would imagine that some states are going to further put these types of election uh, pledge laws in place and they're appropriate under the constitution. And with that, I'll turn it over to Albert. Great, thanks, Maureen. Um, next up is SELA Law versus the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And um, this case originates out of um, a civil investigative demand issued um, against SELA Law, which was a debt collection uh, law firm. And out of such humble beginnings, um, uh, this very important administrative procedure and administrative law case uh, gets its origin. Um, SELA law decided that it would object to the civil investigative demand issued by um, Rich Cordray and the CFPB on the basis that um, Mr. Cordray's directorship of the agency was unconstitutional. SELA law argued that the CFPB violated the separation of powers because Mr. Cordray was a single director who exercised substantial executive power but could only be removed for cause. That is, under the Dodd-Frank law, um, the single director could had a specific term and only could be removed for cause, not at the pleasure of the president. Um, the district court ignored these arguments uh, and enforced compliance with the CID, and the Ninth Circuit uh, affirmed. Um, uh, subsequently, um, the Supreme Court took certiorari and held that the single director structure did in fact violate the separation of powers. Um, the Supreme Court noted that there were two critical pillars of agency governance um, that motivated this ruling. The first was uh, the case of Humphrey's executor. And in that case, which came out in 1935, uh, the challenge was regarding the Federal Trade Commission, five member body, to uh, govern the activities of that agency. And in that case, like SELA, uh, the petitioners claimed that certain four cause restrictions on the removal of the FTC commissioners violated the separation of powers. Uh, the Supreme Court disagreed, noted that this commission was a five member commission, a multi member commission. It was nonpartisan or bipartisan. Uh, it had staggered seven-year terms, and the individuals who served on that commission had significant expertise. So Humphrey's executor stands for the proposition that where you derogate or delegate sufficient, significant executive functions, it's okay as long as, as it's to a panel of experts, bipartisan, with significant uh, control. Second was uh, the Morrison case, and in the Morrison case, that dealt with for cause removal protection for individuals 
single individuals with certain administrative or non-policy-making functions. And that case involved the derogation or delegation of authority to an independent counsel to investigate bad acts uh, by members in the executive branch. In reviewing that case law, the Supreme Court held that the CFPB could not withstand and did not fit into that general governance guidance uh, for agencies uh, under the Constitution. Um, the Supreme Court held that there was no basis in history nor any place for a single director structure of this significant authority uh, under the Constitution. The um, Supreme Court held that it was critical that the director of the CFPB had substantial coercive power over millions of consumers and a huge portion, i.e., the financial sector, uh, of the American economy, that it could issue, quote, billion-dollar fines, billion-dollar fines. The Supreme Court then, in what can only be viewed as a flurry of, uh, of writerly ingenuity, described why uh, removal at will by the president fits into our constitutional structure. It noted that the president is the only federal officer that is elected by the entire nation, that he is uniquely uh, sensitive to the jealousies and watchfulness of the entire polity. Because of that, his delegation of power uh, is at two individuals, like a director, a single director, has to be sensitive to those changes in the political winds. Um, in a couple, uh, in one subsidiary holding, uh, the court then held that the single director structure was severable. Uh, accordingly, all the rules and administrative enforcement actions issued by the CFPB could continue to stand. This case, however, is probably going, in addition to being the first case relating to corporate governance of a government agency issued in many years, um, this case is going to be notable for its dissent uh, by Justice Thomas. And in that dissent, Justice Thomas took, um, uh, took issue with the uh, exception of Humphrey's executive, executor writ large, that the president should not be able to delegate to multi-member bodies, multi-member bodies, its significant executive policy-making authority. Uh, that dissent is likely to result in multiple challenges to existing structures for multi-member bodies that have governance uh, control over significant sectors of the American economy. Some examples are the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, CELA law, uh, an important administrative law decision, uh, and really a great read. Uh, next up, I think, is uh, Carol in Bosa. So uh, in this case, the Supreme Court held that an employer who fires an individual merely for being gay or transgender violates, violates Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, a true landmark decision from this uh, last term. It was a 6-3 decision, and Justice Gorsuch wrote for the majority. The question that was presented in Bostock came to the court actually in three different cases. So Donald Zarda, who was a skydiving instructor, and Gerald Bostock, a child welfare services coordinator, each filed lawsuits in federal court alleging that they were fired because they are gay and that doing so was in violation of Title VII. In Zarda's case, the Second Circuit agreed and held that Title VII bars discrimination based on sexual orientation. However, the 11th Circuit came to the opposite conclusion in Bostock's case. The third case, all of which were argued on the same day before the court, uh, was filed in Michigan by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. It was filed against a funeral home which fired an employee named Amy Stevens when she announced that she would be living as a transgender woman. The Sixth Circuit in that case agreed, and they also held that Title VII protects transgender employees from discrimination. In what was truly a groundbreaking victory for LGBTQ rights, Justice Gorsuch, writing for the majority, said that the answer is clear. Title VII prohib prohibits discrimination based on sexual orientation. So as you all know, Justice Gorsuch is a strict textualist. So how did he reach that decision? He said that the word sex in Title VII means either male or female. 
And so to determine if somebody was terminated because of sex, all you have to do is decide whether changing the employee's sex would have resulted in a different outcome for that employee. So he posited a situation where two employees were both attracted to men, but one of the employees was a man and the other employee was a woman. And if the employer fires the man for his attraction, but not the woman, then it follows that the man has been fired because of sex. In other words, as he said, quote, sex plays a necessary and indisguisable role in the decision, exactly what Title VII prohibits. So the employers in these cases, they argued that Congress did not mean to include LGBTQ discrimination as part of the prohibition on discrimination because of sex. And they said so because there have been several failed attempts to amend Title VII to explicitly include those protections. But Justice Gorsuch said those bills might easily have failed because Congress believed that LGBTQ employees already were protected by Title VII. Not surprisingly, Justice Alito wrote in dissent, joined by Justice Thomas. And while he sympathized with the results the majority reached, saying that it was, quote, humane and generous, close quote, Justice Alito also said, quote, there is only one word for what the court has done today, legislation. So he accused the court of using textualism to update old statutes like Title VII to bring them in line with current values in society. And he said that the court had taken the step that the legislature de declined to take, passing a law, in his opinion, incorporating protections of LGBTQ employees into Title VII. Justice Kavanaugh dissented separately, and not surprisingly, his dissent was a little bit more tempered. Uh, he agreed with his dissenting colleagues that because Title VII is written, does not protect LGBTQ employees, in his opinion, it was up to Congress to do so and he agreed that the court had usurped that role. He agreed with Justices Thomas and Alito. However, uh, Justice Kavanaugh concluded his dissent in a really striking way. He remarked on the important victory that had been achieved in these decisions by gay, lesbian, and transgender Americans. And let me read to you how he concluded his opinion because it really is quite striking. He said, quote, Millions of gay and lesbian Americans have worked hard for many decades to achieve equal treatment in fact and in law. They have exhibited extraordinary vision, tenacity, and grit, battling often steep odds in the legislative and judicial arenas, not to mention in their daily lives. They have advanced powerful policy arguments and can take pride in today's result. Under the Constitution's separation of powers, however, I believe it was Congress's role, not this court's, to amend Title VII. So an enormous victory that even in dissent, Justice Kavanaugh recognized had been achieved for members of the LGBTQ community. And as Justice Ginsburg would say, therefore for all of us. And with that, I will turn it back over to my colleague, Maureen Soles. So next for this case, Our Lady of Guadalupe School versus Morrissey Baru, we have to take a little trip back in time to 2012. And there the court issued an opinion in Hosanna Tabor versus EEOC and recognized the doctrine of the ministerial exception. And that doctrine bars ministers from suing churches and other religious institutions for employment discrimination. Um, and so what we have here are two teachers at a Catholic school in the Los Angeles area. One uh, was terminated uh, for what she claims was age discrimination and another teacher um, claimed she was terminated as she was being treated for breast cancer. And so both teachers sued um, for um, discrimination claims. Ultimately, the district court held that the ministerial exception bars their claims um, and granted summary judgment for the schools. The Ninth Circuit um, reinstated the teachers' lawsuits because it says that the ministerial exception normally applies where an employee plays a religious leadership role but that these teachers played a more limited role, mostly teaching religion from a book. The court issued a seven to two decision, Justice Alito wrote for the court and said, the first amendment bars the government from interfering in the right of churches and other religious institutions from deciding issues related to faith and doctrine. And said that closely related to that right is the idea that religious institutions should be able to make their own decisions about how they are run 
including the selection of the individuals who play certain key roles. And because the ministerial exception grew out of that idea that religious institutions should be able to both choose and if necessary, remove the ministerial minister without government interference, it applied to these teachers. The court did provide a helpful fact, uh, list of factors to consider in determining whether the ministerial exception applies. Whether the religious institution calls the employee is a minister is not standing alone dispositive um, because some faiths don't have that formal title. Um, in, academic training can be important, but the absence of the training is not necessarily a deal breaker. What matters is what the employee does. It's not enough to say a school with a religious mission entrusts a teacher with the responsibility of educating and forming students in the faith. Judicial intervention into disputes between the schools and the teacher threatens the school's independence in the way a first, the First Amendment does not allow. Justice Thomas issued a concurring opinion because he would have gone farther, and he would have ruled that if a religious organization labels an employee a minister, courts should defer to that designation. Justice Sotomayor dissented and was joined by Justice um, Ginsburg, and she said that as a result of today's decision, teachers could be fired for any reason, even if they taught primarily secular subjects, lacked substantial religious titles and training, and were not even required to be Catholic. This opinion, I think, just uh, builds upon the court's previous opinion in Hazana Tabor and says that religious institutions uh, that have clear statements of their religious mission and the employee's role in that, in advocating and teaching that religion, should be um, the basis to apply this ministerial do uh, um, exception doctrine. And so I believe going forward, courts are going to hesitate before they undermine or second guess religious institutions that designate uh, an employee as such. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kyle to warn us all about how to protect ourselves. Thanks. Thanks, Maureen. This is, a, this is an interesting uh, Fourth Amendment case. Uh, one of the interesting things about it is that the facts were not, the salient facts were not at all in dispute. The facts are pretty simple. Here they are. Um, a deputy mayor saw a 1995 Chevy 1500 driving down the road. He ran the plates. Uh, the run, run came back and told him that the driver or the owner of the vehicle's license was suspended based on that information and that information alone he stopped the vehicle. He asked for identification. The identification given was for Charles Glover Jr. Uh, Charles Glover Jr. was the owner of the vehicle. His license was suspended, and so Mr. Glover was cited. Mr. Glover sought to suppress the entire stop, claiming that the officer didn't have reasonable suspicion to initiate the stop. He won at the trial court. He lost at the appellate court. He won again at the state Supreme Court. In an eight-to-one decision, he lost. Um, the Supreme Court held that the stop did not violate the Fourth Amendment. An officer had reasonable suspicion uh, based on the common sense understanding that the person who owns the vehicle is driving the vehicle. The court rejected the idea that the officer needed to point to some sort of specialized skill or training in order to reach this conclusion. But the majority's holding was that in this situation, the majority stressed the narrowness of the decision that common sense provided the basis for the reasonable suspicion. But Justice Sotomayor, the sole dissenter, wasn't buying this narrow holding rationale. She said this elevated police hunches to the, to the status of reasonable suspicion and said the majority's opinion paved the road to finding reasonable suspicion based on nothing more than demographic profile. In her view, she wanted to see something more than just a hunch, more than just common sense, that the person driving the vehicle owned the vehicle. And I think this case raises, raises a lot of interesting questions going forward, despite the majority's insistence that this was a narrow holding. How does this apply when the car has a Uber or Lyft sticker? How does common sense apply in other circumstances? We, we may get, start seeing common sense used more and more as a justification for reasonable suspicion stops. Um, Albert, I believe you are up. Thanks, Kyle. Um, uh, the next case up is Ramos uh, versus Louisiana. And um, this is an important uh, criminal law decision, but perhaps even more important, it's uh, a case really about jurisprudence. And so uh, in this case, Ramos was charged with a second degree murder 
and convicted uh, in Louisiana by a non-unanimous jury. So there are two states in the union under state law that permit convictions in a criminal case by non-unanimous jury, both require 10 vote majorities. That's Louisiana and Oregon. Um, uh, in holding, uh, well, the defendant challenged his conviction uh, that it violated uh, the Sixth Amendment as incorporated against the states requiring uh, a unanimous jury verdict. And the Supreme Court, uh, in a fairly straightforward analysis, indicated um, that yes, indeed, the Sixth Amendment did require, uh, from an original to intent standpoint, a unanimous jury verdict in criminal cases. It then discussed prior uh, precedent, uh, Apodaca, uh, which indicated there could be a functional test, a functional equivalency test for uh, certain states which permitted um, conviction by a non-unanimous jury. Uh, the Supreme Court overruled Apodaca said that you have to have a unanimous jury uh, in major uh, criminal cases, uh, and the conviction was overturned. This case, however, is going to be uh, cited and analyzed, I think, for Justice Kavanaugh's concurrence. In that concurrence, Justice Kavanaugh indicated that he agreed with the majority, that everyone agreed that Apodaca uh, was wrongly decided. Then Justice Kavanaugh um, then Justice Kavanaugh um, uh, indicated that the process of overturning prior precedent rests on the principles of stare decisis. And Justice Kavanaugh reviewed many cases and, in, and identified a number of factors uh, that uh, determined whether stare decisis required uh, deferring to prior precedent or permitted overturning. He then synthesized this down into three factors. One, is the prior decision egregiously wrong? Two, was the prior decision uh, a cause of significant jurisprudential or real-world consequences? And three, would overruling prior precedent upset reliance interests? Justice Kavanaugh then noted that um, the principles of stare decisis and diverting from prior precedent had led to some of the most significant decisions in Supreme Court history, then provides a huge string site and some of the cases in which the court ignored uh, it or went against prior precedent, overruled prior precedent, included Obergefell, Miranda versus Arizona, Erie Railroad versus Tompkins, and then he noted the most important decision in the Supreme Court's history, Brown versus Board of Education. And so in that concurrence, Justice Kavanaugh is laying the groundwork for a principled way when stare decisis applies, when it doesn't apply. The impact of this case um, is cabined within the criminal law sector uh, relating to convictions and unanimous jury verdicts, but how it will be jurisprudentially applied as the court addresses major social issues in the future uh, is likely going to incorporate Justice Kavanaugh's uh, uh, well-written concurrence. Uh, next up, I think we have Maureen. Yes, we're going to talk about Espinoza v. Montana Department of Revenue. And here, the, Mon the Montana legislator created a scholarship program that provided uh, dollar for dollar tax credits for donations to private scholarship organizations. And that these organizations then used the money to fund scholarships for children to attend private schools, which in Montana was primarily religious schools. But the Montana Constitution um, includes a provision that bars gov government aid to any school controlled in whole or in part by any church, sect, or denomination. And so to reconcile these provisions, the Montana Department of Revenue promulgated Rule 1, and that prohibited families from using the scholarship funds at religious schools. And so some families challenged Rule 1 because they wanted to be able to use the scholarships to keep their children in private Christian schools. Ultimately, the Montana Supreme Court struck down the tax credit program, holding that it violated the state constitution's ban on aid for churches and religious schools. And this is an important uh, procedural aspect because when it arrived at the US Supreme Court, the program was invalidated and that's what the, ultimately the dissents focused on. But the chief writing for the five member court and using that power that Kyle highlighted at the beginning of assignments 
wrote, uh, reversed and said, because the state's court's interpretation of the Montana Constitution violated the US Constitution, which protects the free exercise of religion, um, it could not survive. States are not required to subsidize, subsidize private education, but if they opt to do so, they cannot exclude religious schools from receiving those funds simply because they are religious. The no aid provision in Montana's constitution clearly prohibits religious schools from receiving these funds through the tax credit program solely because the schools are religious. Therefore, it's subject to the strictest scrutiny and can only survive if it's narrowly tailored to promote the interests of the highest order. And because the court found it did not, it could not survive. Justice Thomas wrote separately to reiterate his belief that the establishment the court's establishment clause jurisprudence is far more limited than the court has interpreted to, um, it to be. And he wants the court to reconsider it, its um, jurisprudence in that respect. And this is important because it demonstrates the principle that if the Supremes ask, they shall receive, because next term the court will um, consider um, its establishment uh, clause jurisprudence. Separately, Justice Ginsburg dissented and highlighted the procedural aspect of this case that I noted. The Montana Supreme Court decision invalidated the entire tax credit program, so no one is receiving any money for private schools, whether secular or religious. Justice Ginsburg, therefore, said that no one's being treated differently based on religion and there's no constitutional problem. Here, Justice Sotomayor also issued a dissent, and in many ways, it was much more uh, combative dissent than what, how Justice Ginsburg wrote. Although they used the same justification, Justice Sotomayor spoke with much stronger language and highlighted the courts, um, how inappropriate it was for the court to do so. And with that, I will turn it uh, back over to, I believe, uh, Albert. Great, and um, uh, in the interest of time, we're gonna um, start to move quickly. And these next two cases uh, really relate to uh, very straightforward applications of statutory construction that have a lot of impact uh, in the corporate sphere. So uh, in SEC versus Liu, this case related to the SEC's equitable remedy of disgorgement. Um, the SEC in enforcement actions um, uh, argues and frequently imposes disgorgement of funds relating to investor fraud. Uh, Mr. Liu operated an EB-5 fund, which you may know, is a fund that permits um, people to invest half a million dollars and in return uh, receive um, uh, expedited visa status or green card status. Uh, this fund was intended to construct a cancer center uh, in the Northern District of California. Uh, unfortunately for investors, uh, Mr. Liu and his partners um, misappropriated most of the funds, and the SEC brought suit uh, against Liu and his company and sought disgorgement. Liu argued um, that um, under prior precedent, Kokesh, um, that disgorgement was a penalty. It was a penalty and could not be an equitable relief permitted under uh, 15 U.S.C. 78 U.D. 5, under the Securities and Exchange Act. Um, uh, in particular, um, Mr. Liu argued uh, that um, disgorgement of the entirety of the capital invested in the fund did not take into account all of the legitimate business expenses he had expended in trying to build uh, this cancer center. The Supreme Court held that um, disgorgement uh, was in fact a permissible remedy uh, for the SEC, but um, that it would, it, should operate as a constructive trust over the funds received. That means it was confined to the profits received uh, by individual defendants or tortfeasors. Uh, it would take into account legitimate business expenses uh, and was much more limited um, than what the SEC had been using disgorgement uh, for. Um, uh, uh, Justice Thomas, in a notable dissent, again, noted that disgorgement is not an equitable remedy and therefore should be unavailable under uh, the Exchange Act. The impact of this case is that the SEC's use of disgorgement, which in recent years, more than recent years, for many years, had been used to prop up victim restitution funds, is much more limited and much more subject to challenge. The next case, Sulema, 
uh, uh, relates to an application of the um, uh, of ERISA and breaches of fiduciary duty. And again, in the interest of time, the short version of this case is that in order to establish a breach of fiduciary duty um, uh, uh, for an ERISA plaintiff, you have to establish actual knowledge um, that uh, the ERISA plan has uh, violated uh, the plan requirements and breached fiduciary duty. This significantly extends the statute of limitations for um, those types of claims. Um, we have a couple more um, slides in our, uh, for uh, the prior term, um, and you will all be getting um, this PowerPoint subsequently from Kristen. And so I think in the interest of time, we're going to move on to what we see in the coming term, and that's Kyle. Thanks, Albert. Um, I'll start with talking about what I think is likely to be one of the most consequential cases of the upcoming term and perhaps the term in its entirety, and that's California versus Texas. This is the challenge to the, the I should say, the latest challenge to the Affordable Care Act. As you recall, several years ago, uh, Chief Justice Roberts joined with his liberal colleagues in upholding the individual mandate in that law determining that it was a tax and not a penalty and therefore was constitutional uh, under Congress's power. Um, in 20, I believe it was 2017, uh, Congress passed tax reform laws and one of the things those laws did was it moved the mandate to zero so that there was still the tax slash penalty but that, it was, that there was effectively no, uh, no penalty there, no money to be had. Um, some states' attorney generals have claimed that this rendered the law other, uh, unconstitutional other states have sought to defend the law, and so what you have a fight is a fight between states' attorneys general. Um, this could be an existential challenge to the Affordable Care Act, or it could resolve around the, the court's doctrine of severability. In the, the last time the court talked about severability was in the Celia Law case that Albert described. Chief Justice Roberts described it more as a scalpel than a bulldozer. And it'll be interesting to see whether the, the court will apply that reasoning here. Of course, this case is being argued um, just one week after the election. The court has expanded the time for oral argument. I think each side gets an hour, so it should garner a lot of attention. I'm sure you're already hearing a lot about this case and, and it will continue to be very closely watched. The second case, the personal jurisdiction case, is actually two cases uh, raising the same issue, both involving Ford Motor Company. And the facts are, the facts are interesting. Um, the one involving a Montana court involves a, a Ford Explorer that was made in Kentucky, sold to a dealership in Washington, that sold it to an Oregon consumer who drove it to Montana where it was involved in a single car accident. The second case involves a Crown Victoria that went through five owners before it made its way to Minnesota where it was involved in an accident. In both cases, the court is going to take on the question of whether or not um, the respective states can exercise personal jurisdiction where Ford's conduct in that state, its contacts with that state, have nothing to do with the alleged injury. This could be, this could be a case that makes, uh, that cements personal jurisdiction as being potentially broad reaching or might restrict it to a certain degree. It's a closely watched case. As I mentioned previously, it was supposed to have been decided this past term. It was one of the cases that it'll be uh, that was pushed to this upcoming term. It's going to be argued later this month, and I think it'll be a, an interesting one to watch. Uh, Carol, do you want to say a few words about Fulton? Sure. So on November 4th, the justices are going to hear oral argument in Fulton versus City of Philadelphia. This is a case that was brought by several foster parents and the Catholic Social Services, challenging the City of Philadelphia's policy of not making referrals to the Catholic Social Services because that agency refuses to certify same-sex couples as foster parents. So the challengers lost in the lower courts and they've asked the Supreme Court to consider three separate questions. The first is what showing do plaintiffs have to make to succeed on this type of claim of religious discrimination? Can they succeed only by showing that the government would allow the same conduct by someone who held different religious views? Two circuits have held that. or uh, must courts consider other evidence that the law is not neutral and generally applicable, as six circuits have held? The second question they've asked the court to consider is whether the Supreme Court should reconsider its 1990 decision in Employment Division versus Smith 
And in that case, the court had held that the government can enforce laws that burden religious beliefs or practices as long as those laws are neutral or generally applicable. So again, another issue looking at whether or not precedent is going to be upheld. And third, whether the government violates the First Amendment when it makes participation by a religious social services agency in the foster care system contingent on actions and statements by the agency that conflict with that agency's religious beliefs. A quick review of the docket shows more than 70 amicus briefs were filed in this case. And of course, the potential addition of a new justice, Amy Coney Barrett, to the court could have a very significant impact on the outcome of this particular case. So that's something that we will all be watching in the term ahead. Uh, and then one more case that we're observing here is Rutledge versus Pharmacy Care uh, Management Association. And this case relates to um, uh, uh, an Arkansas law uh, which required pharmacy benefit managers to raise reimbursement rates if the drug cost falls below the wholesale cost. Uh, pharmacies also could appeal to a state agency uh, about the PBM reimbursement rates. The Eighth Circuit held that ERISA preempts state regulation in this sphere, and uh, the Solicitor General and the AGs from 31 states encouraged SCOTUS to take cert uh, and reverse. Um, this case is an important case uh, for insurers, for employers, for pharmacies, for drug companies, for anyone related to uh, and, has in, and has sensitivity to drug costs and insurance coverage of drug costs. Um, it would make clear, uh, if reversed, the ability of individual states to set individual drug cost reimbursement rates within that state. And I think Kyle's taking us home. So I'd like to, I'd like to spend the, the last few minutes uh, of the presentation looking forward by looking back a little bit. As we've already discussed in this presentation, um, issues related to coronavirus, to COVID-19, and the state shutdowns that have followed um, have already found their way to the Supreme Court. And I think this is a trend that will likely continue going forward. Um, there were two cases from the Supreme Court that could be hugely relevant to these. These were all just, these both were decided in the last century, but I think they will inform how the Supreme Court and both the lower federal and state courts to uh, address issues related to the coronavirus might address them. And they're very interesting in their own rights. And I'd like to briefly discuss them here. The first is Jacobson versus Massachusetts. Um, Jacobson was a Lutheran pastor. He was from Sweden originally. He apparently had a bad experience with vaccinations in his own, in his home country. When he came to the United States, Massachusetts had a requirement that everyone be vaccinated for smallpox. He refused and was fined $5. He took his challenge all the way up to the Supreme Court where he lost in a seven to two decision. The Supreme Court, the law was upheld under the state's police power, allowing the state to impose mandatory vaccination requirements because, quote, upon the principle of self-defense of paramount necessity, a community has the right to protect itself against an epidemic of disease which threatens the safety of its members. That was a 1905 decision. The second case involves a, a strange California law that for a time made it illegal to transport indigent people, who both know money, into the state. Uh, the facts involve a Mr. Edwards who was asked by his wife to go to Texas, pick up her brother and bring him back to California. Mr. Edwards complied, he drove to Texas, he met his brother-in-law, Mr. Duncan, and learned that Mr. Duncan was without employment and had about $20 to his name. The two drove back to California, and by that time, the $20 had been spent. Mr. Duncan spent some time in California without work before finally finding a job. Mr. Edwards, the driver, was, um, was charged under this indigent people lawsuit and he challenged its, con excuse me, its indigent people statute and challenged its constitutionality. The state defended its constitutionality saying the state had an interest among other things from, from preventing disease being brought into the state. But the state lost in a 9-0 decision and said that the state's police power did not extend as broadly as California would have liked. And I'll leave you with this quote, which I thought was quite striking. 
It is frequently, quote, it is frequently the case that a state might gain a momentary respite from the pressure of events by the simple expedient of shutting its gates to the outside world. But in the words of Mr. Justice Cardozo, the Constitution was framed upon the dominion of a political philosophy less parochial in range, it was framed upon the theory that the peoples of the several states must sink or swim together, and that in the long run, prosperity and salvation are in union and not division. So keep an eye out for the Jacobson's case and the Edwards case going forward. I know the Fifth Circuit has already issued a decision that discusses the Jacobson case in detail. I think these cases will be touch points as we navigate the, the months and, and probably years ahead. So I want to thank all of my esteemed colleagues, our panelists, Kyle Cutts, Albert Lynn, and Maureen Souls for participating in Baker Hostetler's annual review of the Supreme Court's term, both past and present. Um, I'd also really like to thank Kristen Gold and Emily Spiller for their assistance in putting this program together. And none of us lawyers could do this without their expertise and uh, we're very grateful to them. You know, there's a lot here. Uh, last term was a fascinating one. There are some really important cases coming up. As everybody knows and says every day, we're living in unprecedented times. Uh, it is going to be quite striking to see what happens not only with the confirmation battle looming in the United States Congress, but with a really important term ahead um, and potentially some very consequential arguments and decisions with respect to the election, as well as the matters that we just discussed. So I wanna thank all of you for joining us um, and know that we will be back again next year hopefully not in this format. Um, hopefully we can do this in person, which is always our preference, uh, but we really appreciate your attendance today and uh, wish you all the best. Stay healthy, stay safe. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kristen Gould to let you know how to get your CLE credit. This is the second of two CLE codes. Please record the code SUPREME2, SUPREME, the number two, for the post-program evaluation momentarily. Please make sure to write down this code if you are requesting CLE credit as you will be asked for it in the CLE evaluation at the conclusion of this program momentarily. Supreme 2. Since we are at time, we will do our best to address any questions um, from, from attendees in the next 24 to 48 hours. We will follow up in the next two days to provide a copy of the presentation, provide a recording of the webinar, and provide contact information for speakers. If you are seeking CLE credit, please fill out the post-program survey with your bar number and the two CLE codes. You can access this survey one of two ways. Option one, you can use your phone camera to scan the QR code displayed on your screen right now. Option two, the survey will show up in your internet browser when we end this Zoom webinar momentarily. Any additional instructions for CLE in your state will be emailed to you. Thank you again for joining Baker Hostetler.